Good morning. Welcome to St. George's online service for October the 4th, which happens to be St. Francis Day. So we're celebrating creation today along with St. Francis. So I hope you'll join in with songs and the prayers and that you'll enjoy the service. God of the sparrow, God of the whale, God of the swirling stars, how does the creature say all? Oh? How does the creature say praise? Please say with me the collect for purity. Almighty God, to you all our hearts are open and desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we say the collect for St. Francis Day. Grant us, Almighty God, to follow the example of your holy servant Francis, to care for all of your creation, and like him, may we follow in the footsteps of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. St. Francis grew up in the state of in the city state of Assisi in modern day Italy. He was the son of a wealthy family and as a young man he wasn't at all religious in fact he was rather a party boy. But later in his life he got a call to follow Jesus. He took that that call very very seriously. In fact he got, gave away all his fine clothes and he dressed like this in a simple brown cloak tied at the waist with a rope. There are many legends that we hear about St. Francis and we know about him from his love of animals. And one of those legends involved a fierce wolf which was attacking a village. The wolf came into the village at night and he killed their animals, their chickens, their pets and their farm animals. And the villagers wanted to get rid of him. So Francis went up into the mountains and he found the wolf. And he lay, made the sign of the cross in front of the wolf, and the wolf lay down in front of him. And he said, Brother Wolf, I know that you get very hungry, but the villagers are very, very afraid of you. So I'd like to make peace with you, and I'd like to make a deal. If you will stop attacking the villagers, I'll get them to agree to come and feed you every day, so that you won't go hungry anymore. And that's indeed what happened. Something that we owe St. Francis for in today's world in church comes at Christmas. Because St. Francis was the very first person who ever brought the Christmas nativity scene inside the church. But Francis did more than just bring it into the church. He brought a real nativity scene with a real manger, a real ox and a real donkey. Must have been a pretty big church. But chances did this in order that people could understand the Christmas story more exactly and more directly. And of course, we continue this tradition today in that the Milton churches put on their annual Way to Bethlehem pageant with real animals and, and actors to make the scene more easily understandable to ordinary people. And so that's how St. Francis's Day is important to us and how we continue to live it out. Amen. I sing the goodness of the Lord, who filled the earth with food, who formed all creatures through the world, and then pronounced them good. Lord, how wonders are displayed, never I turn my eye. If I survey the ground I tread, or gaze upon the sky. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at your command, and all the stars obey. 
A reading from St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21. Jesus said, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. He, and, uh, now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of Christ Today we're celebrating the feast day of St. Francis of Assisi. And that's why I'm sitting here next to this small statue of St. Francis to record my homily today. Before I do that though, I want to just speak briefly about today's parable from Matthew's Gospel, the parable of the wicked tenants. This is the third of a series of three readings that we've had in which a vineyard has featured. And we recall that a, vi that a vineyard is a metaphor for the land of Israel and the people who live there. So they represent the promised land. Each of these episodes has become more and more pointed and at the very end of today's reading the scribes and Pharisees realize that it is them that Jesus was speaking about. So in the parable of the wicked tenants the landowner leases out his vineyard. At the end of the harvest, he sends his slaves to go and collect the produce that are, is owed to him as the rent. But the tenants who are wicked, they beat up the, the slaves and they kill some of them. So the landowner says, then I'll send my son. Surely they will respect my son. But the wicked tenants have other ideas. They decide to kill the son and take the vineyard for themselves. So the landowner says, I'm going to kick these guys out. They'll be displaced and I'll get better tenants. In Christian tradition, we can consider this to be a nutshell of the story. God sends his son to the people of Israel as the Messiah, but they don't recognize who he is. They kill him. Of course, it's not the people of Israel who kill him. It's the temple leadership who arrange for him to be killed. And so therefore, God decides that they should be kicked out. Now, by the time that Matthew wrote his gospel, events had changed a lot in the 50 years since Jesus had died. The Romans had, in fact, conquered Israel completely and had destroyed the temple. The Jewish leadership were no longer in charge and in fact the whole of Jewish traditional worship had been irrevocably changed by the fact that the temple was destroyed. So Matthew inevitably would have brought his story up to date because it wouldn't have made sense. And so we don't know how much of the story is original to Jesus and how much is due to Matthew's editorialising. So for Matthew, of course, Matthew would have seen 
this as a victory, a kind of victory over of Christianity over Judaism, because the split between Christianity and Judaism was already well underway. Let me now turn back to St. Francis. He was born into a wealthy family, and in his early life he was a playboy. Later he became a soldier, a mercenary. But after a serious illness he stopped the partying and became a more serious kind of person. Eventually he made a pilgrimage to Rome, and when he returned home he worked in a leper colony. Later, while Francis was praying in a ruined chapel, he had a vision of Jesus coming to him and saying, Rebuild my church. Francis took that instruction completely literally. He sold everything he had to buy equipment and supplies and began to build, rebuild the church walls stone by stone. Somewhat later, Francis heard a sermon on the subject of Matthew chapter 10, in which Jesus sends out his disciples into the villages to preach the good news of the kingdom of heaven. They are to carry no purse, no staff, no extra shirt, no sandals and no money. They are to go in complete poverty and depend on the hospitality of the people. Francis determined that he should follow Jesus' instructions and imitate Jesus as best he could. He took a vow of extreme poverty. He began to dress in a ragged, uh, rough, brown cloak, tied at the waist with a rope as a belt. But he had such charisma that gradually people joined him. And eventually they went off to Rome to petition the Pope to allow them to be called an order of friars. That's to say, traveling monks who were not ordained, not priests. As I've said, they took their vows of poverty very, very seriously. But central to Francis' life was traditional Christian teaching. He held the Eucharist in enormous respect, as he also did the priests who handled and consecrated the sacred elements. But of course, in popular imagination, we tend to think of Francis as merely some kind of rather eccentric uh, animal lover who preached to the birds. And that comes, of course, from one of his most famous uh, stories or legends about him, in which he and his disciples were sitting down in the country. At some point, Francis gets up and starts to preach to the birds. And I'll read to you something of what he said. My sister birds, <coughs> You owe so much to God. He gave you freedom to fly through the sky. He's clothed you. You do not have to sow or reap, yet God feeds you and gives you rivers and fountains to drink. You have mountains and valleys for shelter, tall trees for your nests. Therefore, you must always and everywhere sing your songs to praise God. Of course, even 2,000 years before the time of St. Francis, some of the psalmists had also felt the need to express their wonder of the glory of creation and their magnificence of their creator. And I imagine Francis reciting one of those psalms, number 148, as he might have trudged from village to village about his daily work. And I'll read part of that to you. Praise God, sun and moon. Praise him, you shining stars. Praise him, fire and hail, snow and frost. Praise him, mountains and all trees, deep seas and all fish, wild animals and cattle, creeping things and flying birds, young men and women alike, young and old, all together. Francis wrote his own psalm. It's called the Canticle of the Creatures. It refers to brother sun and sister moon, to the wind and the water, and even to sister death. It also expressed his deep sense of brotherhood under God for all his fellow creatures and men. He wrote, he considered someone to be no friend of Christ if they did not cherish those for whom Christ died. In his love of the natural world, Francis recaptured some of the essence of Celtic Christianity, which conventional Roman Catholicism had long ago expunged. It seems to me that these ideas of creation resurface every few hundred years, and we're living in a time like that now. Perhaps that's why we consider Francis to be the patron saint of uh, all animals and also of the environment, 
and it's why we hold pet blessings and traditional celebrations on St Francis Day, but not unfortunately this year. Modern Franciscans still exist. They take vows of poverty, obedience and chastity, just like Francis' own followers. They wear brown robes with a rope around their belt. Today Franciscans use a different phrase, alternative orthodoxy, to explain and differentiate themselves from traditional church doctrine. Orthodoxy means right belief. Their alternative orthodoxy is called orthopraxis, which means right living, right style of living or right actions. In other words, they say how you live your life is more important than what you believe. Your actions are more important than your creed, if you like. I think that Francis would definitely approve of this alternative orthodoxy, and I certainly do myself. Amen. There's not a plant or flower below where nature glory is known. Clouds arise and tempests blow by order from your throne. While all that borrows light from you is ever in your care, and everywhere that we can be, you got our present there. We begin with the prayer that is attributed to Saint Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace, where there is hatred. Let me sow love. Where there is injury, let me sow pardon. Where there is doubt, let me sow faith. Where there's despair, let me sow hope. Where there's darkness, let me sow light. Where there is sadness, let me sow joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive and in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. The invitation today is gracious and loving God and the response is we bring our thanks and praise. At this time of the year, we give thanks for the glory of the Canadian fall season, for crisp mornings and sunny days, bright blue skies and vividly colored leaves. So even in this time of pandemic, let us feel the same sense of inexpressible joy and awe as St. Francis showed as we praise God for, the, for creation's wonder. Gracious and loving God, we bring our thanks and praise. We give thanks for our daily food and for all those whose work and skill bring good gifts to us in many diverse ways. Artists, farmers, engineers, teachers, musicians, and factory workers to name just a few. Gracious and loving God, we bring our thanks and praise. In this time of pandemic, we especially give thanks for those gifts and graces that have inspired women and men to be of service to others, doctors, nurses, surgeons, and caregivers. For the gift of insight and imagination that have inspired the research and brings healing and fulfillment to the lives of many. Gracious and loving God, we bring our thanks and praise. We thank you for all in whose lives we see goodness, kindness, gentleness, patience and humility, and all the fruit of the Spirit. Remembering especially those St. Francis of Assisi's, who gave up a life of luxury and privilege to be a servant of the poor and unloved, and who cared for bird and beast in an age that seemed uncaring of such concerns. 
Gracious and loving God, we bring our thanks and praise. We thank you for the life that we have been given and for all those whom you have given us to share it, our family members, our friends, and this community of St. George's. Gracious and loving God, we bring our thanks and praise. We thank you for reminding us to pray for all those who have asked us to pray on their behalf, trusting that God will offer them new hope and strength in all their difficulties. Gracious and loving God, we bring our thanks and praise. Finally, we thank you for the commandment that Jesus gave to his disciples and that he gives to us today, that we should love one another. May we do our best to uphold this commandment with all those we meet, stranger and friend alike, those who are different from us equally, and those like ourselves, as those like ourselves. Gracious and loving God, we bring our thanks and praise. Now we say together the prayer that Jesus taught his own disciples using the following words. O heavenly creator, may your name be praised in all the word, world. May we follow what we perceive as your will today and every day. Give us breath and enough for today. Keep us in your straight path and help us to forgive those who have hurt us in any way. May we be kept free from all temptations and always remember to offer you praise and glory. Amen. We join our voices to praise God and to thank God for all our blessings. And the blessing of God Almighty, our Creator, Father and Mother, Redeeming Son, Jesus our Brother and Guide, and the sanctifying and inspiring Holy Spirit be with us all this St. Francis Day and always. Amen.